Hello and welcome to this event that's part of our Meet the Candidate series looking at the leading contenders in the race for mayor of Los Angeles. I'm Austin Cross, host of All Things Considered Midday on KPCC. These events are part of coverage made possible through support by the Committee for Greater LA in partnership with the Conrad in Hilton Foundation and the Weingart Foundation. Tonight, we're talking to Karen Bass. And throughout the event, we invite you to share your questions for the candidate. You can submit yours through the Q&A function located on the right side of your screen. We also solicited questions from the public before tonight. We've received your questions and I will incorporate them into our conversation. Live captioning is also available. Just click the CC button on the bottom of the video. And now let's meet the candidate. Congress member Karen Bass is in her sixth term representing the 37th Congressional District, which includes Venice Fairfax in Los Angeles, which is also where she grew up. In Congress, she serves on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs and the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime and Terrorism. She also served as the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus in 2019 and 2020. Before coming to Congress, Bass served in the California State Assembly. In 2008, she became the first African-American woman in U.S. history to serve as speaker of any state legislature. Now she wants to trade in her long commute from Washington for a work-from-home job, so to speak. <laughs> Congress Member Bass, thank you so much for making the time. Thanks for having me on. We are going to start tonight with one of the most pressing issues facing Los Angeles, that's homelessness. And to kick things off, let's watch this brief introduction from Ethan Ward, who covers homelessness for KPCC and sure. LAS. Hi, I'm Ethan Ward. I used to be unhoused. I now cover the homelessness crisis. There are roughly 66,000 people experiencing homelessness on any given night in Los Angeles. Those numbers could rise when we learn the results of our 2022 count later this spring. Some are young students, they're over the age of 55, they're transgender, some are working full-time jobs. They're living in their cars, in RVs, and on the streets. Voters responded to the increased visibility of homelessness by voting for measures that would build more apartments for people experiencing homelessness. But those units are coming online slowly and there aren't enough shelter beds. There have been lawsuits, some have called for the homelessness crisis to be treated as a natural disaster with federal emergency responses. One thing is certain, homelessness is the biggest issue on the minds of housed and unhoused voters this year. Earlier this week, you might know Heidi Marsden resigned as the head of the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, and that's the agency that provides services to unhoused people on behalf of both the county and the city of LA. In an essay, she wrote that this complex governance puts LASA in the center of high-level policy and funding differences without the independence or authority to mediate issues. Is having a joint authority like LASA the best way for the city to address homelessness? Well, I think having a joint authority uh, might be the best way, but not necessarily like LASA. I mean, for example, uh, Los Angeles County has 88 cities in it. And I truly believe that in order to deal with this problem, we have to deal with it region-wide, which is the county. And uh, the city and the county have different responsibilities, but I do think that there needs to be a new governance structure and maybe a joint powers agreement in a different way might be what's needed. And some people have pointed to the model of Metro. Uh, where we've been able to build public transportation. Obviously, there's so much more we need to do, but I think we need to look at other models. Clearly, there needs to be somebody in charge who has the power to make decisions, and I'm sure that that is the essence of, she, of what she was saying in terms of her frustration in running LASA. So if it was not LASA, though, would the city be just building another bureaucracy from scratch then in that case? Well, I am definitely do not believe in that. I mean, I subscribe to the viewpoint that um, the individual on the tape mentioned in terms of I do think that this is an emergency. I don't think the city or the county has dealt with it like it's an emergency. I actually think that they have not approached it, meaning the city and the county have not approached this problem as though they are absolute resolute on solving it. People talk about addressing homelessness. I want to solve homelessness. 
And I don't think that you can do that without a whole of government approach. That means the city and the county working lockstep, but it also means the state and the federal government. And so the individual on the tape mentioned the federal response and a FEMA response, and I do think that that's what's needed. We need a federal response for a, a variety of, of reasons. I can continue on if you want to. <laughs> we would love to, but let me ask you this, and okay. I think that you might get into it that way. In the past, that you've said that the homelessness uh, issue here has metastasized. Yes. And it's worth pointing out that you're a trained physician's assistant. Yes. Uh, you've worked in emergency rooms. You've even worked with unhoused people. Why metastasize? Well, what I was saying is, is that I was drawing a comparison with a chronic disease. If you have high blood pressure, you have it for life. You don't even think about it being cured. You understand that you're gonna be taking medicine for the rest of your life. I do feel that that's the way policymakers have approached this. In other words, we've been addressing homelessness, and while we were addressing it, it metastasized, meaning it exploded into the crisis that exists today because we didn't approach it from day one as this is an emergency that has to be solved. This is the United States of America. How do we have people sleeping on the street? So you might get into explaining your approach in this question, but if you were elected mayor four years in, how would you measure the success of your reform? I think you could drive down the street and measure the, the success. I mean, if people are still on the street in the massive numbers that they are today, and there's not a clear path, a clear light at the end of the tunnel. So let me just give you a couple of examples. I feel that people are unhoused for a variety of different reasons. What I'm concerned about now is that the unhoused population is being approached as though they are a monolith. And we need to look at the different categories, the different reasons why people are unhoused. We need to house them immediately. We need to get people off the street immediately. But then we need to address why they were unhoused to begin with. Is it a person that's just unhoused for economic reasons and maybe just needs some financial support? Is it a young person who was in the foster care system that got kicked to the curb when they were 18? Is it a veteran? Is it a person who was formerly incarcerated and when we downsize the prison population, we didn't think about where people were gonna go? Or is the individual an individual that's suffering from a chronic disease, a substance abuse, mental illness, or some other type of disease? We have to address why the individual was unhoused. And so part of that is gonna require federal participation because there's federal rules and regulations that in my opinion need to be waived so that we, we, we can rebuild our substance abuse and mental health systems. You know, it's worth mentioning that Marsden said that we're housing 200 people daily, but 225 exactly. people become homeless daily. Exactly. Is there a way to stop that Exactly. I mean, but again, we have to have a comprehensive approach and that's part of it as well. I mean, one of the reasons why voters are so upset over taxing themselves with the two propositions is because they haven't seen a demonstrable difference. Now, I know that people are being housed. I know that. And when I talk to my constituents in my congressional district, I always tell them exactly what she said, that for every 200 folks that are being housed, 250 more are falling into homelessness. So part of a comprehensive a a plan and approach means that we have to prevent people who are teetering on homelessness now. Now, we could talk about it in the context of COVID and federal relief that has come to protect renters. But at the same time as you're protecting renters, you also have to protect the landlords, the majority of whom are mom and pop landlords who might own an apartment building or, or this. And uh, we have to make sure that they don't foreclose on their mortgages. And then you have two problems. You have the person that loses their housing and the person that loses their property. So we need to continue to support people, even though we seem to be, we seem to be, I almost hesitate to say this, we seem to be working our way out of the pandemic, and tomorrow there might be a new variant, but <laughs> at least where it is today. That's very possible. When you talk about this support, often that support costs money. Where does right. that money come from? Well, the money comes from the federal government and the state government. And, you know, we are really fortunate, and I don't know how long this is going to last, but we do have money now. I mean, the federal government sent hundreds of millions of dollars to Los Angeles. The state government um, has money, and you know that the governor in his uh, budget a couple of months ago uh, set aside, I believe it's a billion and a half dollars to address homelessness. So we do have money right now. What, what I'm worried about, though, is that it won't be used in the best way possible. Well, we've invited a couple of community members to the studio to ask questions of Great. the candidate. Tonight we have Lexis Bayonne, who is an unhoused community member. Lexis, thank you so much for being here, and please ask your question to the candidate. 
Hi, Ms. Bass. Hi, Alexis. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Same so, here. So um, I'm actually an uh, alumni at a drop-in center, mm -hmm. um, my friend's place down in Hollywood. Um, I'm, I'm currently housed. I, was, I wasn't Good. housed before, but now I am housed because of this drop-in center. So I'm going to be asking you a question and honoring um, a client that's there at the drop-in center. And this question is, um, what is the number of unhoused people? Still, why is it still high? So, you know, uh, we're all interested to know what the number is because the count hasn't been taken for the last two years because of COVID. It was just taken, so we're waiting. I'm going to guess that the number in Los Angeles is probably around 50,000. And I say that because two years ago it was 40,000. And I can't believe that more people aren't, aren't housed today than there was, you know, a couple of years ago. And I think one of the reasons is because the city nor the county have really approached this with the urgency that I feel that they should have. And they've allowed the normal process to take place. It's just for an example, you know, to build something, you gotta go through all of these offices, you have all of this paperwork, you have all of this stuff you have to do. And then it winds up being very expensive. And so what I would like to do is to say, to heck with that, people are dying on the street. I'm, why would you spend time going through, you know, four or five different city departments? It's actually a lot more than that. If somebody to me is a builder and they want to build housing for the unhoused, I think that they should have their own line, meaning that things should be expedited so that it can be built as quick as possible. Uh, number one, if you do it that way, it'll be cheaper, but uh, we can also build more and build faster. Thank you. And why is it taking so long for us to address the issue? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I just have to believe that we have not in a resolute way said that we are going to solve this. And I think that we were addressing it bit by bit, bit by bit, and then it just got completely out of hand. And I think that that's, that's too bad. I just have to tell you something. 30 years ago, <laughs> I was at an organization that I started called Community Coalition. We were trying to take over motels then for the unhoused, okay? Wow. It took a pandemic for people to go. Because in, in South LA, for example, in one city council district, we had 54 motels and no tourists. So what do you think was happening at the motels? So to me, why couldn't we use those hotels for housing? And then I wanted to prevent people from falling into, into being unhoused. So we fought against welfare reform when welfare reform happened, because we knew if that passed, then women and children were gonna join the ranks of the unhoused. So I think it's bad policy decisions from before, and I also think that we cut up the safety net. We ended pieces of the safety net. We pretty much um, really reorganized drug treatment programs. You used to be able to stay in a drug treatment program for 12 months, now you get 30 days. So how can somebody who's been strung out on the street be clean in 30 days? And then guess what? After 30 days, we put you right back on on the same street you were on. So that system has, in my opinion, kind of collapsed. And then we never really built an adequate mental health system. The most expensive mental health institution in our city, you probably know, it's the county jail. I think that's <laughs> a crime, first of all, that you would have a jail to deal with people who are mentally ill. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Thank you. you mentioned mental illness, and we just got a question from an audience member who wants to know how you'll address that unmet need for mental health amongst our unhoused so, neighbors. So that's an example of why you have to have the federal government's intervention, okay? Because right now, the federal regulation says that you really can't have more than 19 people in one facility. So Supervisor Hilda Solis has to build, she's building mental health facilities on the campus of County General Hospital. She has to build three separate facilities because of that restriction. What I want to have happen is the federal government to waive that restriction. So see, I have the benefit in this race of being a member of Congress, and I'm gonna be a member of Congress for the rest of this year. So I'm not gonna talk about if I get elected mayor, this is what I wanna do. I'm trying to work on these issues right now in DC, talking to our Secretary of Health and Human Services and saying we need to have this waiver so that we can house more people who are suffering from mental illness. Now, if you put someone in a facility, a hospital, who are mentally ill, it's not designed for them to stay there forever. It's designed to stabilize them, and then you could send them to housing that is more appropriate. 
So drill down on a specific, you vowed to house 15,000 people during your first year in office, but it's not clear what proportion of those people would go into permanent housing or a temporary shelter. Is it possible to fulfill that promise without temporary shelters? No, I don't believe so. I mean, I believe that temporary housing is needed. It needs to be a part of the mix. But I do think we need a new design. I think, and I would, would wonder what our community, Lexus, uh, feels, because I think the old-style shelter, which is a big room with a bunch of cots, um, not only do people not want to go there, I don't think it's appropriate anymore. Just think of COVID. <laughs> so we have to have a new design of temporary housing. And I think that there are several designs out there. There's tiny homes. There's also, um, I visited uh, LA Family Housing that has temporary housing where you have an individual um, kind of cubicle that you are in, uh, in, in a big room. So you have privacy is the point I'm trying to make. You have privacy and you have barriers so that you're not exposed to somebody who's directly next to you. And you think that that would help compel a person who's living on the street to go to a temporary shelter as if well, they thought I, that they would get more Well, I think privacy. if they, number one, felt they'd be safe, they would be more inclined to go. And, uh, and two, if they knew that it was just step one and step two was uh, interim housing or permanent supportive housing. And not everyone needs support, supportive housing. We're talking with Congresswoman and mayoral candidate Karen Bass. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask tonight's candidate a question, you can do so through the Q&A function located on the right side of your screen. So now I want to transition into housing. My colleague David Wagner covers that topic for KPCC and LAist, and he sets the scene for us with this video. I'm David Wagner, and I cover housing for KPCC and LAist. California has the highest poverty rate in the nation, mainly due to the cost of housing. Surveys during the pandemic revealed that about two-thirds of LA tenants are burdened by high rents, and more than 40% live in overcrowded homes. Most LA residents are renters, but the city reserves three-quarters of its residential land for single-family homes, homes most Angelenos cannot afford. State regulators recently rejected LA's plans to accommodate new housing, they said the city failed to address long-standing patterns of racial segregation. Many renters lost work during the pandemic and fell behind on their rent. But more than a year after the city launched its rent relief program, most applicants are still waiting for funds. Promises to curb rent hikes and displacement have not stopped tenants from facing huge increases and threats of eviction. At the same time, small landlords say they've been unable to pay their mortgages after being cut off from the promised relief. Congresswoman Bass, you've said you would invest in low-cost housing where one job would be enough to support a family, and that sounds like a dream, I'm sure, to many, many Angelinos. How many homes are you aiming for, and how would you make that possible? Well, I mean, what the statistics uh, say is that L.A. needs 500,000 more residents. Uh, obviously, that's over a period of time, but we can't wait too long. So I think we need to look at all of the bureaucracy that I was describing, what it takes to build. You know, I've talked to uh, people, uh, developers, who say they can go down the street to Downey and have no problem building. But when it comes to Los Angeles, there is so much red tape you have to do. And one of the things that I would do if I have the privilege of being elected mayor is that there would be one individual in my office who would be the who would be in charge, a deputy mayor, a housing czar, whatever the title is, but there would be one person who would be in charge and would be responsible for bringing together all of the different departments that deal with housing to see how do we expedite the process. One of the other reasons why it takes so long, especially when you're talking about building housing for the unhoused uh, and you're needing to access public dollars, again, the red tape there takes a very long time. So I would like to bring together our city financial institutions to come up with bridge funding, which means I'm a developer, I'm trying to build, I don't have my financing right now because it's gonna take several months. So I borrow from the bridge loan fund and then I pay it back when my financing comes through. That would help speed up the process. We need to look at transit-oriented development, meaning building housing near uh, where there is transit. We need to look at commercial corridors. There's a lot of different models, a lot of different proposals, and I frankly think that this is one situation where you need all of the above 
Now, all of the above uh, is because some neighborhoods, one model might be better than in other neighborhoods. Some neighborhoods might not have uh, a metro station, so doing transit-oriented development there doesn't make sense. Here's another audience question that was just sent in. They want to know, how do we deal with neighborhoods that keep preventing affordable housing from being built? Sounds like the NIMBYs. Yes, exactly. And, you know, that really is a problem in our city. But that's why I also think that, you know, uh, obviously politicians have a critical role to play. But we've got to create a spirit and a sentiment in our city that this is everyone's problem. You know, for example, there's, there's one neighborhood that I visited that are very clear. They do not want to see uh, the, the character of their single family neighborhoods change. They don't want to see that happen. They don't want to have multifamily units built in their neighborhoods. But what they were completely open to was building multifamily units on the commercial corridors. So there might be neighborhoods that don't want one thing but are willing to go along with something else so that we're not constantly tied up in court. Um, and, and, but I do think it's going to create a new spirit and a new attitude in our city. So it sounds like both you'd go on a neighborhood-by-neighborhood neighborhood basis, but also you would work with them, too. I mean, if somebody is adamant that they don't want that housing there, you might find something that does work so you're not fighting those battles. Right, so exactly, well. because what you don't want to have happen is to just be tied up forever in court. The other thing that you don't want to have happen is you don't want to have happen where the only place you can build are in lower-income areas who don't have the resources to fight you in court. Are you open to rezoning to make this housing available? I think we have to have everything on the table. You know, we do. But we do have to do it in concert with the neighborhoods. Well, let's turn now to policing. Uh, topic change here. Last year in Congress, you introduced the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act to combat police misconduct, excessive force, and racial bias in policing. What is the most pressing issue facing the LAPD today, in your opinion? Well, I mean, I, I, don't, I think that there's multiple issues. Um, you know, number one, it's the staffing. Um, you know, we've had several hundred police officers retire or quit, and we obviously need to uh, restore that in terms of the officers that left. Uh, then there is the uh, police community relations. And the way I describe it is, just using my congressional district, for example, I cover South Central, but I also cover Century City and more affluent areas in, in West LA. And same police department, but I think there's two different styles of policing. You know, one I would call the guardian style, where the police, their attitudes toward the people that live in the more affluent neighborhoods are completely different than their attitudes that, uh, for the residents of South Central where I believe you would have more warrior-style policing. And I think that that's real problematic. It erodes trust, and uh, it doesn't allow the police department to solve some crimes. For example, uh, we know that there has been an uptick in crime, but uh, there has been a real big uptick in homicides in the South LA area, and about 50% of those homicides are unsolved. And I think one of the reasons, I'm sure there's many, but one of the reasons is the difficulty in relationships between the community and the police in that particular part of town. I've been reviewing your positions uh, on policing and the policing bill, and you've used the word accountability several times, and you want the chief of police and the police to embrace accountability. What does that look like? Well, you just think about it for a minute. Um, a police officer is probably the only profession that I could think of that has the power to take away your life or your freedom. And you would think that somebody with that amount of power would want to be completely transparent and accountable, which means if you brutalize somebody or if you violate somebody's civil rights, you shouldn't just have you know, no accountability. I mean, there, there are reports uh, that was just, I think it was about a month ago, looking at police accountability. And you have situations where even when the chief of police has said this officer should not be a police officer, and they're able to go to um, a, a citizen-led board that then puts them right back on the force. So that I would call no accountability. Mm -hmm. And that was because of a ballot measure that was passed that I think some people believed was going to actually hold police more accountable by having a citizen's review board. That's not exactly what it's called, but that's what it is. Uh, to make a determination after a decision, a disciplinary decision, has been made, but it turns out that that's not working. So within that ballot measure, the city council can revoke 
and, and dismantle that board. I think they need to. I think that we need to look for another model. Is Michael Moore doing a good job as LAPD chief, in your view? You know, it's not fair for me to say that. I will tell you that if uh, I'm elected mayor, I would review his performance. What were the goals when he was hired? What has he accomplished? We know crime has ticked up. Why? Um, so, I, I mean, I, I have a good relationship with the chief. I check in with him regularly because I'm always studying crime trends because for the last three decades, I have worked very much on um, crime uh, prevention. And uh, I'm always interested when things are trending one way or another to look at the reason for it. You know, one thing he told me about uh, the pandemic, uh, which I thought was really interesting, we know that there has been an increase in crime, but he said, you know, some crimes really haven't garnered a, a lot of attention. He said there's been a real uptick in road rage. So, you know, you haven't heard much about that, but it's interesting how people are reacting all around the country in terms of coming out of the pandemic. And it's worth reminding people that the mayor has power to appoint the chief. So right now, not going to give the performance review. You would no. wait until you can review the, the yes. files. Well, last week, Mayor Eric Garcetti proposed an 8.5% increase in the police department's operating budget. That's about $149 million. Do you support that decision? You know, I'm, uh, I am not sure. I haven't reviewed it, but this is what I'm aware of. He's not increasing the number of officers by a tremendous amount, I think maybe 20 or 30. And I believe that the bulk of the increase is for overtime, so I would want to understand why, and I don't know the answer uh, to that. Uh, what I am calling for, though, is that we have the number of officers hired that we are budgeted for. Uh, many people are talking about we need to have 1,500 officers or 2,000 more, 2, more officers the fact of the matter is the only way to do that would be to have drastic draconian cuts to city services or the city would go bankrupt. So uh, some neighborhoods, as I've traveled around the city, or should I say zoomed around the city, some neighborhoods want to see an increased police presence. So I'm calling for hiring civilians so that the officers that are sitting behind the desks can be uh, returned to the beat. No, obviously there are some activists who are very vocal about the concept of defunding the police or taking money away from the police and putting it into other resources for people. Where do you stand on that? Or does it sound like, it sounds like you want to keep the staffing at least where it is right now. Yes. But where do you stand when it comes to the concept of taking money away for other resources? Does that work? Oh, well, opinion? what absolutely works are funding other resources. I don't happen to believe that you need to take money from the police when crime is increasing to fund other things. I don't believe you need to rob Peter to pay Paul. Let me give you some examples. Last year this time when the furthest thing in my mind was running for mayor, I told you that I've spent many years focusing on crime prevention and intervention programs. And um, I was able to get several million dollars to fund these programs in the South LA part of my district. Now these programs, uh, work with uh, men and women who were formerly gang involved. They're called community intervention workers. They're trained, they're professionalized, and what they do is, is they work with police, but they work with the community. When there has been a gang um, a shooting or something like that, they will intervene to prevent a retaliation. Um, there's the community safety partnership. So there are community-based programs that are not officers, but they do work in conjunction with officers, and I think we need to invest in that. So what I do believe is, is that when a crime is committed, you have to respond to that crime. The person has to be held accountable. But I want to invest significant resources in preventing the next crimes, if that makes sense. Deal with the bank that gets robbed today, but prevent robberies in the future by investing in proven crime prevention strategies. Why do you think the Police Officers Union PAC is spending about a half a million dollars to oppose your campaign? <laughs> well, I think that the um, police union, uh, which is interesting, by the way, you should know that the police union, which is the Police Protective League, you should know that they were very active with me uh, fighting for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. They were very supportive of that. Hmm. I think that um, there are parts of the uh, police department that really is resistant to any type of reform, and, um, and I think that that is problematic, and they might see my candidacy 
even though I've called for hiring officers, even though I have supported, oh, by the way, one of the, the points of the mayor's budget is to give raises to police officers. And it's my understanding that those raises were supposed to be given two years ago, but were delayed because of the pandemic. And so even though I, in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, calls for hundreds of millions of dollars for police. So I have supported them, but they have chosen to take out um, a half a million dollar expenditure to attack my campaign. So we talked about that funding for things without taking the money from the police. Mm -hmm. And in Congress, you introduced the Community-Based Response Act, mm -hmm. uh, which would provide funding for mental health professionals to respond to some emergency calls. But that bill, as far as I know, did not get a vote at the time. It's not finished. It's not finished. No, it's still going through the process. How would you find funding for that kind of response? Well, oh, no, so there is, you know, again, that was looking uh, toward the future. And what that bill provides is hundreds of millions of dollars to health and human services for a co-responder model for mental health emergencies. So after George Floyd was uh, murder, murdered several months after, I looked at about 100 officer-involved deaths around the country, and I would say 30 to 40 per percent of them involved people who were experiencing a mental health crisis. That's a tragedy. I don't think any police officer goes into the academy thinking that they're gonna come out and deal with mental illness. And so what, ha what we have done in society is we've divested from the social safety net, we've divested from health programs, social programs, economic programs, and when things fall through the cracks, we expect the police to come and clean up the mess. And I think that that's a real fundamental problem in our society that needs to be corrected. So my legislation, which I'm doing in conjunction with um, uh, a senator, um, calls for money to health and human services to train people to deal with mental health crises in conjunction with the police. Very similar to the model around child welfare. When there is a child who is in danger of neg uh, neglect or abuse, you don't send in LAPD, you send in a social worker. Now LAPD might be on the curb, but it's the social worker that goes in. It's the same type model that I think we need to use with mental health crises. Right now, families are left to dialing 911 and praying that their family member is actually helped and not hurt. You said it's not finished yet. Do you feel like there's enthusiasm? Yes. Democrats, Republicans? Let, let me tell you, bill? yes, there is enthusiasm. Does that mean it's gonna pass? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's enthusiasm for a lot of things. But I will tell you that in the meantime, though, what I have done, because they do allow us to fund projects, so I am funding projects in my district to address these issues, whether we are talking about violence prevention, mental health, homelessness, all of those issues are issues I've worked on for many, many years, and, and now I have the opportunity to bring federal resources directly to projects. I've been bringing and voting for and supporting federal resources for lots of issues in Los Angeles, but this is bringing dollars and handing a check to a specific organization. We're speaking with Congress Member Karen Bass, who wants to be the next mayor of Los Angeles, and this is just a reminder for our audience that if you have a question for the mayoral candidate, you can submit it using the Q&A function on your screen. And now we're going to Turn the page a little bit now and look at systemic racism. It's an issue that's important to our readers, our listeners, and uh, to get us into that, let's watch a quick video from my colleague, Josie Wong. I'm Josie Huang, and I cover Asian American communities in Southern California. There are dozens of Asian diasporas here, and the issues they face are so wide ranging. Gentrification, inadequate housing, immigration policies that separate families for decades, wage theft on the backs of immigrants who keep our society running, and also language access. Many have also encountered racism. In the last few years, we've seen that racism escalate into violence directed at some of our most vulnerable community members. LA is celebrated for its racial diversity, but it's also one of the most segregated cities in this country. It's a place where time and time again, we've seen systemic racism rear itself. Me and my colleagues at KPCC and LAist have long reported on public demands to restructure policing and to make more strides towards equity in education, housing, and wages. Being mayor of LA means having to confront all of it. Tomorrow marks 30 years since the start of the LA uprising. 
and Loyola Marymount's Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles is out with a survey based on conversations with about 2,000 Angelinos, and more than two-thirds of the people that they spoke to said it is very likely or somewhat likely that within five years, we'll see riots or civil unrest in LA like what happened in 1992. What does that tell you? Well, uh, it's a big warning. Um, I think it's a tragic finding, and uh, it just makes me so much more committed to this race because I think that a political campaign can be fuel for division or a political campaign can be fuel for unity. I've spent the last several decades of my life building coalitions across race, class, ideology, geography, and that's what I want to do in this campaign. So anytime you have a city that's in a crisis like we're in now, there's two ways you can go. You could turn against each other or you could turn toward each other. And, um, and that's what I'm very, very concerned about. Now, one thing that I think is underreported, every five years we look back at the civil unrest, and I think every five years I always struggle that it not be distorted and the history be, be, be distorted. So one of the root causes of the civil unrest was really profound economic issues. If you go back and you look at the tapes of people looting, you see them looting food, diapers, clothing, basic necessities, because the economic situation in the early 90s was very, very, very challenging. And that was when we were beginning to experience um, uh, homelessness. As a matter of fact, we didn't even use that term before that time period. So here we are at another crossroads where economic divide, economic inequity is such a, a huge issue in our city. It just shows the urgency of addressing these issues so that we prevent another implosion, explosion, however you want to look at it. It's a whole new generation of people to 30 years at this point. Right. And you talk about the economic uh, factors that are part of that. How would you diffuse something like that that could be you know, bubbling over four years, maybe well, eight so, years? So addressing income inequality to me is, is fundamental. I think the question, the reason why we have so many people unhoused is it is an extreme manifestation of profound income inequality. And what I mean by that is the difference between the wealthy and the poor is so huge in this city, and frankly, the middle class has been disappearing where the city has become so, un so unaffordable. So we have to address first things first, and that's people who are on the street because they have no place to go or because of their you know, social, mental, you know, whatever, is, is the reason why they're unhoused. We need to bring the city together. We need to create a spirit that this is everyone's problem and it's gonna take everyone to solve it. You can't just leave it to politicians. Obviously, politicians have the leadership role to play, but we have to create a sentiment in our city that this is Los Angeles and we can do this. We're better than this. During Mayor Eric Garcetti's time, he raised the minimum wage. Would you consider raising the wage again? Well, let me just tell you, what does $15 an hour get you? I mean, I was a part of the campaign for 15 too. But what happened is, is that the cost of living shot up so high. So what I plan to infuse in every aspect of my administration is addressing income inequality. Let me just give you an example. Climate change. We have... A, a plan to be a hundred to have a hundred percent renewables in the next you know twenty uh, plus years, and what I learned when I was in Sacramento and we passed the first climate change bill, do you know how much wealth that created? All of the new businesses de that developed, all of the jobs that developed. Well, so if we're marching toward this goal of a hundred percent renewable, why can't we have it in our heads? that we look at business opportunities in communities of color and low-income communities, that we look at job opportunities, and that we affirmatively plan for that in advance, not just let it be happenstance. So I think that addressing income inequality will be infused in every part of my administration. I want to focus on small businesses. I want to have a, de a deputy mayor for business to pay attention to the business community. I want to protect businesses that exist today, especially those that were hurt, hurt by COVID. But I also want to help communities 
create business opportunities, help them get funding, help them get the technical support, the procurement process. You know, the city does business with all kinds of companies, and a lot of those companies are not even from California. Why can't we look at the city's procurement po uh, policies and procedures and look for ways to bring people into the procurement process so they can benefit off of the wealth of the city? Well, you mentioned the climate earlier, and here's a question that was sent in to us. The person asks, uh, or tells you mainly, specify how you plan to address the climate crisis in Los Angeles, and please explain how you plan to rapidly divert resources from other parts of the city budget to respond to the crisis. Uh, if you do not believe in defunding the police to fund these emergency measures. Well, again, I, we are in a time period. Now, I can't say how long it's going to last, okay? But we're in a time period where we have resources. We just passed trillions of dollars worth of infrastructure funding for the country. Millions of dollars have come to Los Angeles that will help us with our water system, will help us with recycling water will help us with rainwater capture. We are sending in millions of dollars to help with the electrification of trucks. You know, one, the number one polluter in our uh, city are the ports, and then obviously the cars. And so now that the cost of electric vehicles is going down, we need to have charging stations, electric vehicle charging stations. We need to have them readily accessible. That's a small business opportunity. That's a job opportunity. Can't we think to put those jobs and businesses in South LA, in East LA, in Pico Union area, in areas that are low income, where people are struggling <laughs> if they even make $15 an hour? Well, so specifically coming back to the climate crisis, it is affecting many communities of color. A lot of people right. are having some very adverse health effects. How would you address the climate crisis here in Los Angeles? Well, one, as I was talking about the port and the trucks, where do those trucks go? They go through communities of color. Uh, if you electrify those cr trucks, that can be helpful. We have a number of environmental justice organizations and community-based organizations that I think should receive uh, a lot of funding because they have places in, in communities where they're exposed to, uh, to chemicals, whether it might be manufacturing or other type of, of businesses. Um, so I, again, would look at that through a lens of equity, through a lens of income inequality, jobs and business opportunities, and I think that that is gonna be really important. We need to get people out of cars. We need to provide for safe transportation. I mean, I'm a bike rider. I like to ride, but I won't ride in traffic because I'm worried about it. I mean, all you have is that little white line there. Um, when I ride in Washington, D.C., for example, they have barriers, and we have some of that. We're beginning some of that here in Los Angeles. I ride on the beach because I'm afraid to ride in traffic. So I think we need to make uh, bike riding and walking safer, and you know we have a lot of traffic deaths, uh, pedestrians that, that are killed, and we need to expand the funding for programs so that we can reduce pedestrian uh, deaths. So again, I don't look at the city budget as the only place where money comes from, which is why I don't believe you need to rob Peter to pay Paul. For example, one thing that I learned a few years ago is that the city of LA leaves a lot of money on the table that we don't even apply for. So I wanna have either a department that where I hire staff that do nothing but look for money, whether it's federal money, private money, et cetera, but look to bring in resources. Rather than saying I'm gonna take this from the city budget and fund over there, I say I'm gonna expand the pie. We have another in-person question from a community member. Richard Wood joins us, and Richard, thank you for being here. Hello, Richard. What is your question for the candidate? Hi, Congresswoman. Um, I'm glad to hear you talk about climate change because for me, that's the most important issue in any election, and I want all communities to prioritize their efforts. I work in local government. I know we have tremendous resources and capacity that other communities don't have. For this question, I'd like to know how will the city of Los Angeles uh, become a model for other communities on environmental issues under your leadership? You know, um, I actually think the city of Los Angeles is already a model. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't do better and we can't do more, and we most certainly should, and I mentioned that the first thing that I would do would be to work on the port. Oh, there, there's one other point on the port that I wanted to mention. Since the port is the number one polluter, and since our ports supply 40% of the goods for the nation, 
The federal government has already helped, but the federal government needs to help more. So I mentioned electrifying trucks, but we need to electrify other port operations as well. I was glad to see the city council move to say they're not gonna support any new oil, drill, oil drilling. That was an issue that I've worked on over the last few years. We have an oil well uh, near USC, which is also a part of my congressional district called Allen Co. And um, one of the neighborhood activists, they brought it to my attention, it was an apartment building right across the street from the oil well. And the, the neighbors were getting sick. And uh, it was very uh, sad to me that, that one of the brightest, most powerful high school activists you know, went on to college and by the end of her first year in college, got cancer. And it's very hard to say that that didn't come from that plant. And so uh, we were able to shut that down. We were able to stop them from drilling. But we do have oil wells all over the city. And so getting us off of oil, uh, following through with our goals, I think is, uh, will really allow us to be not just the model for other cities, but for the nation. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Richard. Well, another topic we want to take up tonight is education, because even though the city does not have direct involvement with running LAUSD, both mayors Garcetti and Viragosa carved out roles for the city to play in education. So let's hear from my colleague, Mariana Dale. I'm Mariana Dale, and I report on early childhood as part of our education team. Many families rely on a network of caregivers to raise their kids, one that's been stretched thin during the pandemic. Even as the state expands a free preschool program for four-year-olds, wide swaths of Los Angeles are considered child care deserts. Families struggle to find affordable care, and at the same time, workers who are largely Black and brown women often do not make a living wage and are leaving the field. This is important because critical brain development happens in the first years of life. There are consequences when children are not cared for in nurturing and safe environments. Research estimates tens of thousands of LA teenagers and young adults are neither working nor in school. The mayor can play a role in ensuring families have what they need to help children grow and thrive. Now, back in 2018, San Francisco voters narrowly approved a tax on commercial rents to boost the educational quality of child care programs to pay child care workers more and better prepare kids in low-income households for kindergarten. Given the state of child care, would you consider a tax like that? I don't know. I don't know if that would be the best way to do that. Uh, one, I think, frankly, it'd be pretty hard to convince voters to do another tax considering voters are pretty upset about the taxing they have already done. But the point is, how can we get that solved? How can we get that done? And I would absolutely look at that. But I would take it a couple of steps further. Uh, one, when we look at child care, and, and the video was referencing um, younger children, and that's absolutely essential. Mm. But I actually think we need after-school programs, and I don't want to call it child care when someone's in high school. But we need programming for young people until they graduate high school. If you look at juvenile delinquency, if you look at uh, teenage pregnancy, it happens in the middle school and high school years and typically happens after school, after 3 o'clock. So obviously that just address the kids that are in school. But we need programming and support for the kids that are not going to school any longer. We need to get them back in school or get them back in some type of education. So I would absolutely support raising money for that. The question is whether or not I would use that vehicle in which to raise the money. The other thing is, is the idea of community schools, schools then serving a purpose beyond the students that are in the school, but being more of a community center where parents can go to after work and where there's after school programming. I would absolutely uh, work with the school district to support efforts like that. Now, we want to close our time with a few questions from audience members. And one person asks a question that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds right now. Why give up a job as an influential congresswoman to be mayor of LA? You know what? When uh, home is in trouble, you, you come home. And it's not as though I'm living in Washington because Technically, we are in Washington three to four days a week, and I'm home every single week. Um, my deep concern for the direction that our city is heading, and you raised the poll from LMU that talked about there's so much despair 
and anger that we could have another explosion, another civil unrest in the next few years. The fact that we have 50,000 plus people sleeping in tents in one of the greatest cities in the country and people are dying every day and you ask why I would come home to deal with this, that is the reason why. Now I will tell you, it's not to further my career because I'm gambling everything. If I wanted to further my career, I would have stayed in Congress and run for a leadership position. But I am so deeply concerned with where we are going in this city that I decided that this is what I should do. Of course, I've got a little um, support from a lot of people who wanted to see me do this, and all of that was very encouraging and a part of my decision-making process. Well, given the limitations of the mayor's office, this is another audience question, how do you see yourself using your position to affect change in housing affordability, homelessness, mental health, and our civic infrastructure like parks and transit? And they point out it's not a strong mayor city, necessarily. Well, you know, I think the job is what you make it. And I reject the notion that it's not a strong mayor. I think a mayor can be strong. And let me just give you an example. So the issue that we're dealing with of the unhoused population, we're not the only city that's dealing with it. So I've talked to and gotten support from the mayor of Sacramento, San Francisco, Chicago, St. Louis, Compton, Inglewood. I want to be active in the US Conference of Mayors. We need to all band together and go to the White House and say this is what needs to be done because our cities are in crisis. It needs to be treated like a natural disaster. That, that doesn't fall in the description of a, of a strong or a weak mayor. And I, again, have spent a good part of my adult life building coalitions. I mean, I had to run the state legislature where I had to get 80 people on board to make draconian decisions when we were going through the crisis and we had a budget deficit of $40 billion and the state was on the verge of default. I had to bring people together in order to do that. I had to bring people together in DC, the Black Caucus, Latino, Asian Pacific Islander, Native American Caucus, where we joined together, fought the Trump administration, brought billions of dollars targeted to communities of color who we knew were gonna have a disproportionate impact on the, on the health and economies of communities around the United States. I've done that when we were even in the minority in Congress, so, and I believe that I can use those same skills here in Los Angeles to make a weak mayor strong. Make a weak mayor strong. Uh, our website, LAist, recently reported that the city's Vision Zero safety program for bicyclists and pedestrians is way behind in meeting its goals. So what are your plans to make LA's Vision Zero happen as originally envisioned by Mayor Garcetti? And this person says they are asking on behalf of all cyclists who want to expand their use of city streets without feeling like every bike ride could be their last. And this is something that you even touched on. Well, absolutely. Second. And I was referring to Vision Zero when I said that we need to fully fund those programs. I believe that the mayor is talking about increasing the funding. But what I also understand is that program has never been fully funded. And as a bicyclist, <laughs> I would make sure that that um, program is funded and is working properly. And what policies would you enact to make sure that every Angelino has access to fast, reliable, and affordable internet? This is another question from the audience. Well, you know, and that, and that is a, a, a good question. We have to figure out subsidies for some uh, households. And maybe it could be a program like we have with phone access and, uh, and energy access. Maybe it needs to be something like that because, you know, I worried about that during the pandemic when kids were not in school. You know, if you didn't have internet access, I know what the school district did was they provided hotspots. And so maybe looking back at how the school district dealt with that, but um, we do have to figure out how to give people access and make it universal. So uh, one person wants to know what your plans are to improve the uh, tree canopy in underprivileged neighborhoods. I know that's very important. I live in South LA. Tree canopy would be nice. Well, and we lost a lot of trees. You we know, did. we lost a lot. We had a lot of trees removed when we were bringing the space shuttle over to uh, Exposition Park. Uh, we need to plant more trees, absolutely. But we need to figure out how to plant just not new trees because then it'll take a generation. Might take a little while. 
Then one last question is, when Kamala Harris was named Joe Biden's VP pick, there was some pressure on Governor Gavin Newsom to replace her with another black woman, and you were named as one possibility. He ultimately chose Alex Padilla, but if Dianne Feinstein does not run for re-election in 2024, would you consider that seat, even if you're in the mayor's office? No, absolutely not. There is no way I would do that. You know, I think that, that it is a real problem when um, you, you have to, I mean, I want to do this because of what I said about the crisis. So the last thing in the world I would do would be to do this, win this, and then leave. That just absolutely would not happen. And then there's one more question here. How do you There's many black qualified African-American women who could take that job. Very good, very good. Well, let's ask this. How do you expect to reverse declines in Metro ridership by creating a network of bus-only lanes, installing public restrooms in every station, running more buses, and improving more bus shelters? Uh, or this person says, or through hollow, hollow gestures. So I'm not quite sure what they're asking about here, but I mean, how do you expect to reverse those declines in metro ridership? Let's start there. Well, first of all, you know, one of the reasons post-pandemic has been people not feeling safe. And we have to make sure that people feel safe. And one of the things that I would add in, and I know that this is already done, I'm not you know, starting anything new, but we need to have social service providers on those trains as well because we know that uh, some people who are unhoused have been riding the trains and the buses as a form of shelter. And we need to move people into housing, uh, but we need to deal with people, and, and like I said, why are they unhoused? And, and move, them in, move them off the streets, off the buses, off the trains, and into housing. Well, that is all the time we have for this conversation with Congresswoman and mayoral candidate Karen Bass. Thank you so much for your time, Congresswoman. Thank you for the conversation. Join us here on Tuesday, May 3rd at 6 p.m. for my conversation with Gina Viola, a community advocate and a new face in L.A. politics. Next week, I will also speak with Joe Buscaino, Mike Fuhr, and Rick Caruso. These events are part of coverage made possible through support by the Committee for Greater L.A. in partnership with the Conrad and Hilton Foundation and the Weingart Foundation. As a reminder, the primary election is June 7th, and ballots will be mailed to every registered voter in early May. Thank you for your time. I'm Austin Cross.